is Beyond Category, and I'm Eric Felton. We're here at the celebrated Blues Alley Jazz Supper Club in Washington, D.C., where tonight a fantastic swinging singer and guitarist, John Pizzarelli, is going to be performing with his band. But we get to check him out right now. Soft and mellow, soothing and slow, strains of a mellow cello when lights are low. Dear, we're so close together, love's all aglow. About the weather when lights are low, two hearts revealing music has charms, life so appealing with inspiration in your arms, our lips meeting soft. I love you so Why shouldn't we surrender When lights are low Revealing music has charms, life so appealing with inspiration in your arms. Our lips meeting soft and tender. I love you so. Why shouldn't we surrender? John Pizzarelli. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. Now, that's, that's a, a favorite song of mine that you just played, When Lights Are Low. Mm -hmm. and, and that song, that to me has become a kind of uh, an acid test for whether musicians know the repertoire or not, the jazz repertoire, because Miles Davis did this great version of When Lights Are Low. With the wrong bridge. With the wrong bridge. He changed the bridge all around. And there are all these musicians, if you call the tune, who they never heard that the song had a real bridge to. You do it with the real bridge. So Well, I learned, I learned that version, my version, from uh, Helen Merrill. Helen Merrill made a great record of that. Great just singer. Piano. And, uh, but I was always aware. My father used to always say, you know, the guy, he didn't do the right bridge. 
So I had to make sure uh, I had a good record. I always liked Helen Merrill's record of it, so that's why I learned the song. Now, you mentioned your father telling you that the, the, the guy didn't use the right bridge. Now, that brings up that your father is one of the great jazz musicians Les of Paul. all time. Yes, <laughs> what a great guitarist, <laughs> the multi-tracking. No, Bucky, Bucky Pizzarelli. Pizzarelli. Yes, Bucky Pizzarelli. And, and Bucky Pizzarelli is, has a specialty, really, that is in something of a, of a dying art form, an art form that you're keeping alive, which is rhythm guitar. Oh, yeah. And, well, um, I'm trying to keep it alive. It's so hard to find somebody who understands how to play chomp, chomp, chomp on well, the guitar. Well, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very, uh, well, you know, it starts with the guitar players who were in, uh, on, in all the radio bands, Carl Kress and Dick McDonough and that group of guys, and going back to Eddie Lang, who all played that stuff. Freddie Green and Bucky, all of that stuff is, you know, passed on to me by my father. And if you don't uh, do it right, he just looks at you, he makes that face, he keeps shaking his head. Uh -huh. And he still does on occasion. But, you know, it's all about the way the guitar is set up, the strings and all those things. And to me, it's really the heartbeat inside of a group. Like when we played Lights Are Low and you have that nice little rhythm inside it, it really makes the song travel nicely. Part of a tradition when jazz was dance music, right. and it's it's a dance rhythm, and I think that jazz has kind of lost sight of the the dance rhythm part of the music. And my it's, my the biggest compliment you can pay our group is if you start dancing, you know. And we and every once in a while in the back of clubs, uh, you see a couple will start to dance and things, and you go, oh, and then you know you got you got the right beat. Growing up, your father was not only one of the great jazz musicians, but he was in New York and, and uh, you had all sorts of friends of your father's around who were themselves many of the most important jazz musicians of all time, hanging around with Benny Goodman, whom your father played with. Who were some of the musicians you grew up knowing and, and uh, what did you learn from them? Well, I mean, the, the thing, I don't know if I learned as much from them as I did know that I really liked them. I loved Zoot Sims. Uh, uh, I loved meeting Joe Pass the first time at our house. Uh, Clark Terry. Even, you know, having Benny Goodman wander around our house was very exciting. And I did, when I get to hear them play, I, w I felt like I, I want to be a part of this fraternity. Because uh, these, these guys, not only, after they play, they have a lot of fun and they told great stories. And I, the only way you could get to be in that fraternity was to learn their language. And their language was Honeysuckle Rose, you know, that was, was learning their songs. So you could say, oh, well, I'll, can I sit in with you guys and hope that that would happen, you know. And so Martin and I got to play, uh, my brother Martin, who plays bass with us, uh, got to play at Christmas time with Zoot Sims. You know, we played the clarinet after, you know, a couple days after Christmas would come over. And there'd be this jam session, and we'd be sitting there going, wow, you know, when we knew three songs we could play with them. You know, when you got to be in those rooms, you, you start to cultivate a repertoire that would say, oh, I could play, can I play? And you know, oh, sure. And, you know, so you had to know your, you had to know your chords. When you've written a great memoir of, uh, about your life and the musicians around, and uh, uh, it's called World on a String, and well worth reading. Oh, thank you. And uh, you tell some great Benny Goodman stories in there. My, my favorite is you talking about being around while Benny was rehearsing to play a wedding gig, you know, Benny, oh, yeah. Benny putting together a wedding band. How did, how did that happen? Well, what had happened was a guy said to Benny, I want you to play my daughter's wedding. And, and what would it take? And Benny said some outrageous sum of money. And the guy said, OK. He called my father. He said, you know, we have to play that guy's wedding. He wants us to play the wedding. And so there was a rehearsal in, in a lawyer's apartment on 57th Street. The one thing they had to rehearse was Daddy's Little Girl because he had to play Daddy's Little Girl so the father could dance with the bride. So you've hired Benny Goodman and you're saying, hey, Benny, can you play Daddy's Little yeah, Girl? Yeah, it, it does Daddy's Little Girl. And then the band, then they say, okay, you can play a set. So they're playing, they're sitting there, found my love. They're playing Avalon. They're playing all the Benny Goodman hits and everybody's talking. There's a video of it and they're just sitting up there and I'm going... Benny Goodman's playing at, this, at the wedding, you know, and everybody's, ah, you know, I, how was the filet mignon? Oh, could I have a salad? It's absolutely insane. It's, it's surreal. It really was amazing. You're a wonderful singer, and you're a fantastic guitar player, both, and we heard you really doing your singing on the first tune, but I'd love to hear you play something where you can 
really dig in oh, and great. feature yourself on on the guitar. What what could you do for us? Uh, we're going to do. Uh, uh, it's a, a song written by the Allman Brothers, by Dickie Betts of the Allman Brothers, called "In Memory of Elizabeth Reed." But it's seen through the eyes of West Montgomery's Four on Six. So you'll hear the little homage to Four on Six at the beginning, and then. Uh, the Allman Brothers song in the middle. It's, it's, uh, I think it's quite ingenious. A mashup. Yes, as it were. <laughs> John Pizzarelli.
John Pizzarelli, I loved that. You've done so much music in the great American songbook tradition and solid swing groove, and to find a rock song, groove and bebop kind of take on it, and it all works. To try and draw in listeners from other worlds to our world. How hard is it to find pop songs, though, that have the kind of harmonic and melodic content that works in a jazz idiom? It's, uh, it, it, it can be difficult, but there are some really good songwriters still. I mean, Paul Simon, Sting, Paul McCartney, Joni Mitchell. They're, they're writing some nice things already, the harm harmonically and things like that. You don't have to try and mess with them too much. We did Harvest Moon, a Neil Young song on the current record, Double Exposure, and uh, he got to hear it. And he was like, well, he was surprised with what we put in and what we left out and all that. And you can just a couple of chords here and there, and you can you can put it in your own world, and it it works out. It is it's quite fun actually. I want to talk a little bit about one of the uh, the gigs that really got you where you are and and launched your career back in in 1993. You played as an opening act for Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> how intimidating was it to have to get out there in front of Frank Sinatra well, every? Night? Well, it wasn't you know it wasn't it wasn't uh, opening the show. Uh, that was intimidating, but it was the crowds. I mean, there was 15,000 people in Berlin. There was f another 20,000 in Hamburg, you know, 10,000 in Stuttgart. It was it was not, uh, you know, your normal opening act for whatever, you know. I'd done it with Bucky uh, for Joe Williams or for George Shearing or something, you know, 300 people is this somewhere. So you're just sitting out there and go, where are these people coming from? Once you got by that, then you had to go turn back and you'd be playing and you're looking the wings and there's Sinatra snapping his fingers going, and you're just shaking your head going, this doesn't make any sense at all, you know. So it was quite fun. Now, Sinatra was an intimidating character to a lot of people. I once ran into a recording engineer who had uh, been on a Sinatra session and uh, he was so proud. He said, Sinatra once spoke to me. Right. And it was like, what did, what did he say? <laughs> Get out of the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but one of the things I love about your singing is there, there's a crop of young singers who try to sound like Sinatra. And, you know, that's a, it's a great thing to try to do. I mean, it's a great thing right. to emulate. But you don't try to sound like Sinatra. You sound like you. You can hear all sorts of things in your singing from Nat Cole to Fred Astaire, well, Chet Baker. Well, you, thank you. But it all goes back to Nat Cole, really, from the beginning is that when I was 20 years old and I was working in a club uh, playing guitar for my friend who sang like Dick Hames and, and, and he sang Bing Crosby songs. I had, great, had a great presentation. Uh, and whenever he would say, why don't you sing something? I didn't have anything to sing. I would sing uh, a Kenny Rankin song or a Michael Frank song. But I discovered uh, Straighten Up and Fly Right, a Nat Cole song through this guy's sister. She said, I love this song. Could you learn this song? This is how jazz musicians get famous. They learn songs their girlfriends like. And, uh, but when I played it for my dad, he said, oh, that's Nat Cole. He said, you buy all those records. And that's where I found the repertoire. When you, Route 66, Frim Fram Sauce, Paper Moon, it was the anti-Sinatra uh, thing. For me, it was perfect. It fit my voice. It fit that I wanted to play jazz, had a sense of humor. And it, it gave me 15 years. And, to get to Sinatra so I could be in my late 30s, early 40s, then I could finally say, I've got you under my skin. You know, I could understand that. But at the beginning, Route 66 and all those other, Straighten Up, Fly Right, Baby, Baby, all the time, was a perfect repertoire. And that repertoire also comes with something that I, I think is really special, which is you had this small group working in the big band era, and they figured out how to translate so much of the the what made big bands work and be danceable and exciting yeah. and distill it down into these really tight arrangements, intricate arrangements. You hear something like the Nat Cole Trio's version of Paper Moon. Oh, yeah. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah. yeah, all and that stuff. And they, if you were in that band, you had to know your instrument inside and out. You could play rhythm, you had to play rhythm, you had to play chords like, you know play the shout chorus of the big band and then the single notes. You had all those things you had to be able to do. The guitar player in that band in its prime was a guy named Oscar Moore. Yeah. Incredible guitar player. He's kind of a cautionary tale though. He he um, he decided that he wasn't quite getting the billing that he deserved or the or the paycheck out of the right. success of the band and he went out on his own. It didn't really work out. 
and um, he was he finished his life out as a bricklayer in L.A. He was, he, well, you know, and Irving Ashby, I think, was a cab driver. He was the next guitar player, and uh, Mel Bay and Johnny Smith got in a cab to go somewhere one night, and the cab driver turned around and said, "You're Mel Bay, and that's Johnny Smith," and he was saying, "They said, well." How do, how do you know? He said, well, I'm Irving Ashby. I, you know, he was the second guitar player with Nat Cole. And they found, you know, the Downbeat Awards in Oscar Moore's Garage, all the, all the awards that he won as for the guitar player for that group. You know, it's, it is sad, but what music they left behind. His solo on Body and Soul Alone is, is worth the price of admission. And you also played with Rosemary Clooney. Of course. I did, yes. Yes, you did. Oh. Um, <laughs> I did. Of, you did, and, and beautifully as well. <laughs> uh, what did you learn from Rosemary Clooney? Always tell the truth when you sing. She goes, if you're not, if you don't tell the truth, everybody knows. So you can't fake it. I could listen to Rosie Clooney sing every night with no voice and speak songs. And it would mean more uh, because she knew what she was singing about or talking about even. You know, it was just so uh, amazingly heartfelt. You just go, oh, my God. You know, I'd sit there every night. She used to sing at the end of We Small Hours. Yeah, that's the time you miss her most. She'd say most of all, and every night she'd say most. I'd get goosebumps the second time because I knew she had something on her mind that made that made her sell that every night. And I mean, she was a genius. Now, one of the people who come to see your shows will recognize and know that you learned a lot from that because you often tell stories between your songs and you tell something about uh, about the song and what it means to you and where it came from. What, what do you think that does for, for an audience to learn something about the song rather than just hear it cold? Well, I mean, you, you know, in a sense, it's 50-50. There's the jazz listener that knows what's going on, and they don't mind hearing the story. And then there's the people they bring with them who will say, you know, why, why did my friend bring me here, and who is this guy? And then, you know, you say, well, the reason I'm going to play four Bobby Troop songs right now is because of this. And here's who Bobby Troop was, how he got started, and just in a, in a way, not like it's a classroom, but just to say, you know, I'm going to let you know why we're doing this and, and who these people are, you know, and hopefully set it up in a way that goes, oh, I have something to listen to, and this person actually wants me to listen to this. You know, I think that's, you have to remember, without people in the audience, there's no music. It's if the, if the, if the jazz quartet falls in the forest and there's no <laughs> audience there to see them fall. So it's really, that's the whole they, deal. And you did have they to, make an E-flat That's right. They, they, nobody scores, cares. Right? <laughs> so that's the whole deal. I mean, you have to, if you don't tell, you don't lead the people on, if you don't say hello to them, then they're going to go, you know, it was a nice night, but I don't think he cared that we were even there. And, you know. Now, how many jazz clubs have you been to where the trumpet player takes a solo and then he doesn't even pay attention to what well, else I mean, is every happening. Night you you the, could go hear a band, and then you'll, you'll, you'll see trumpet, saxophone, piano, bass, drums. And they go around the horn, boom, and we're done. And now the next thing, and it's the same way, and you hear, and, and there's no thought given to maybe the bass player should play on just, we'll get one good feature number for the bass player. Or if he's the leader, he can do whatever he wants. You know, it, it, like, can we just figure out a way to make it so at least there's some variety as opposed to this is what we've done. All our lives, you know, and uh, jazz famously being the sound of surprise and all too often not enough surprise yeah. going and, on. And, you know, with brilliant musicians. I, funny thing, I, I remember, you know, you'd see Zoot Sims and I'd go watch him and I didn't care what he did because I knew him, you know. And then one night he said, now Ben Aronoff's going to play. And Ben Aronoff, the piano player, said, I'm going to play My Old Flame. And Zoot sat down with me and talked through the entire... He had the Mets do tonight. I said, well, I'm listening to Ben. Like, oh, you mean they won? I'll never forget it. You know, it's hilarious. Well, you played for us already one of your mashups. And uh, I'd love to, to hear another one of your mashups. Well, we'll only play it uh, if you join us. It's, uh, we do Sidewinder by Lee Morgan up front, and it leads into... Uh, Lennon and McCartney's I Feel Fine. Are you up to it? I hope so. They're both great tunes. I'd love to, to hear how they go together. All right. Well, come on. All right. John Pizzarelli.
She's in love with me and I feel fine I'd like to thank John Pizzarelli for the wonderful swing in music. I'd like to thank Blues Alley Jazz Supper Club for hosting us today. I'd like to thank you for joining us. I'm Eric Felton, and I hope you'll join us again soon for more good music on Beyond Category. <laughs>